Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad that you've decided to join us. We're starting a new series of lessons. We do these in groups of 13 or 14, depending on the situation, and these generally cover a, a quarter of the year. And these lessons will be studied by many of our friends from October through December of the year 2011. We're starting a series on the book of Galatians, and this particular lesson, number one, talks about the person who wrote the book of Galatians, Paul, an apostle to the Gentiles. It's lesson one for study on October 1, 2011. And I would like to invite you to bow your heads with us as we begin this very important study. Our kind and loving Father, would that we could meet Paul in person. Would that we could understand his passion, the fire that burned in his soul to reach out to others and, and touch them with the truth of the gospel. Lord, we need more people like him even today. May we, in some sense, share his fire as we study together this series of lessons is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Background. Saul was born in the city of Tarsus, in the province of Cilicia, of Jewish parents who belonged to a strict order of the Pharisees. He was circumcised on the eighth day and strictly followed all the Jewish ceremonies. If you remember the story of the rich young ruler Jesus was speaking to, he said, all these things I've observed since my youth up. I'm sure Paul could have said exactly the same words. He was certain about the preeminence of the law of God and believed that the temple in Jerusalem was the center of his worship. He was certain, along with all, virtually all other Jews, that the soon coming Messiah would bring relief from Roman oppression. It was unimaginable to Saul that a man executed by the Roman authorities and Jewish leaders as one of the worst of criminals could possibly have been the Messiah. And we need to recognize that when we, when we think about the conflict that went on here between the Jews and the Judaizers and Saul and the Christians and all that they stood for. Thus Saul was determined, in line with the strict Pharisaical training under Gamaliel, to root out the followers of this ridiculous new religion. For a chronology of the book of Acts and the life of Saul, Paul, I would encourage you to either turn to our website at www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X, stands for Theological Crossroads, .org, or you can find almost the same thing, a little different format and some information, different information, in Volume 6 of the SDA Bible Commentary, pages 97 to 102. But as we now know, God had very different plans for Saul, who later was known as Paul. When do we first hear about Saul, Paul, in the book of Acts? What was he doing? Getting ready to go persecute those, uh, root out those people in Damascus, those Christians. Well, we need to go back a little bit before that. Uh, in Acts 7. What happened in Acts 6 and Acts 7, do you remember? That was Stephen. Acts 6, the group seven young men were chosen to be deacons for the Christian church. In Acts 7, one of those, the last part of, verse, of chapter 6 and, and chapter 7, one of those young men, Stephen by name, gave an absolutely incredible sermon, one of the most impressive sermons in all of the Bible, supporting the way of the Christianity. And at the end of that, with a loud cry, the members of the council covered their ears with their hands. Then they all rushed at him in, at once, threw him out of the city and stoned him. The witnesses left their cloaks in the care of a young man named Saul. They kept on stoning Stephen as he called out to the Lord, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not remember this sin against them. He said this and died. And Saul approved of his murder. We shouldn't stop there. We should read the rest of that verse because the rest of that verse is very significant. That very day, the church in Jerusalem, this is talking about the Christians now in Jerusalem, began to suffer cruel persecution. 
all the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the provinces of Judea and <coughs> Samaria. That would mean then that going to those places, the gospel was going to the Gentiles. Yes, not quite yet. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Who was they, going to Jews in other places? Jews who lived in Gentile areas. That was what they thought originally. Didn't work that way. <laughs> You're getting ahead of the story. <laughs> well, the primary characters in the book of Acts were four. Peter, Stephen, we've just talked a little bit about, Philip, and Saul, who later became Paul. Stephen played a key role because First, as one of the deacons chosen by the early church, he performed a tremendous service. And by the way, without, we don't know as much about this, but what made him stand out? He went to the synagogue of the freedmen, and there he argued for Christianity. Now, a synagogue, who, who worships there? The Jews. The Jews. And he, work, worship, he, he argued so powerfully for Christianity, no one could answer him. And you wonder if it was possible that Saul was ever at any of those meetings and tried to argue against Stephen. Good question. But in any case, he was, he was very powerful. So on what basis was Stephen condemned? Do you remember? Uh, somebody said that he spoke against Moses. And Look at Acts 6, 11 to 14. So they bribed some men to say, we heard him speaking against Moses and against God. In this way, they stirred up with the people, the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and took him before the council. Then they brought in some men to tell lies about him. This man, they said, is always talking against our sacred temple and the law of Moses. We heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will tear down the temple and change all the customs which have come down to us from Moses. Does that sound vaguely familiar to anybody? Sounds like the things they said about Jesus. Just almost exactly like the things they said about Jesus. Well, based on Acts, and this is one of the interesting things I discovered when I was looking at this, but look at, let me show you three or four verses here that, um, that point out something interesting. Was Paul a Pharisee? We say yes. He actually says he was a Pharisee in some later on. But was he a member of the Sanhedrin? Well, listen to these verses and see what you conclude. Acts 6, verses 12 and 15. In this way, they stirred up all up the people, the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and took him before the council. Okay? And we drop down to verse, we've already read these verses, to verse 15. All those sitting in the council fixed their eyes on Stephen and saw that his face looked like the face of an angel. Now, notice carefully, all those sitting in the council, which council is this? Sanhedrin. This is the Sanhedrin. Look at his face and saw his face like the face of an angel. Okay? Now coming back. Uh, we've already read these verses. And as the members of the council listened to Stephen, they became furious and so forth. And they, you know, wanted to take him out to stone him, etc. And who was there? Saul approved of his murder. Who was out there crucify I mean, stoning him? The members of the council, right? And then look at chapter 22, verse 5. The high priest and the whole council can prove that I am telling the truth. I received from them letters written to fellow Jews in Damascus. So I went there to arrest these people and bring them back in chains to Jerusalem to be punished. So who was in very close cooperation in carrying out the will of the council, the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem? Oh. Saul or Paul. Yeah. And then look at verse 26, chapter 26, I'm sorry, verses 9 to 11. I myself that I should, thought that I should do everything I could against the cause of Jesus of Nazareth. That is what I did in Jerusalem. I received authority from the chief priests and put many of God's people in prison. And they were, when they were sentenced to death, I also did what? Voted against them. 
Many times I had them punished in the synagogues and tried to make them deny their faith. I was so furious with them that I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. So if he Who was a votes? voting member of the Sanhedrin is what we're saying, huh? Yeah. For those of you who are Seventh-day Adventists and listening to this message, you will know that Ellen White says that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. But I, I present these verses to suggest that this idea is supported from Scripture itself. Um, that leads us to a couple of other conclusions. Members of the Sanhedrin were supposed to be 30 years of age at least and married. Was Paul at least 30 before he began his ministry and was he married? Well, we have no evidence to suggest that he was an exception to these rules. As I recall, Jesus was at least 30. Mm -hmm. Didn't So was John the Baptist. Wasn't it required that one be 30 before one was considered mature enough yes. to be listened to? Yes. Yep. Well, so now we come back to our friend Saul Paul. Although struggling with his conscience, and why was he struggling with his conscience? He had seen Stephen, and he saw his face shining, and he thought to himself, how did that happen? And Stephen looks up and he says, I see Jesus there standing at the si right-hand side of God. And Paul heard all those words. So he was actually convinced. He was struggling against his conscience, but he was actually convinced that he was right, that Stephen was right. Or Paul was convinced that he himself was right. He could not believe that all the Jewish leaders who had been his teachers and mentors could possibly be wrong. How could this one heretic, even though he had an impressive sermon and this experience that was really quite remarkable, how could he be right and all his Jewish mentors be wrong? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been a time in history, the flood, Tower of Babel, time of Jesus, here at Paul, when modern, current scholarship was right? You're not supposed to ask that kind of question. <laughs> you know the answer to that question. The, the current scholarship which we read about, the ones who are supposed to be in the know, always seem to be not in the know. That's right. Good thing it's different now, huh? Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> what is the possibility that we might be wrong about some of our greatest convictions? Well, if we're with the majority, we're probably wrong. Are we, and this is the question now, are we constantly checking the truth as we know it against biblical writings and spirit of prophecy facts? Jesus, in one of his toughest challenges, as one, or we could also have said, as one of his toughest challenges, knew that before he left to return to heaven, he must find some way to help his disciples overcome the Jewish prejudice against have, having anything to do with Gentiles or Samaritans. Look at some of the steps that he took to overcome these prejudices. Now we're going we're to take a bird's eye view, and we'll come back and look at some more details later. But we're going to take a bird's eye view of Jesus' attempts and, and what he tried to do, or not only while he was here on this earth, but through the disciples to try to overcome these prejudices. See what it tells us about the whole scenario. One, he intentionally traveled to Samaria, spoke to the women at the well, and evangelized Sychar for several days while his disciples were with him. You remember the story of John 4. Now remember, Jews and even Samaritans, even though they're very closely related, weren't supposed to have anything to do with each other, right? Two, he took his disciples across the Sea of Galilee. There was no apparent reason for him to do that. To the area of Gergesa in order to heal one, of two, one or two, some gospels say one, some say two, demon-possessed individuals. After spending only a short time with them, he sent them forth as the first Gentile missionaries. Pretty amazing, huh? Um, you remember the story. I'm not going to take time to go and look at the verses, but there are Matthew 8, 28 to 34, Mark 5, 1 to 20, and Luke 8, 26 to 39. Later, having sent those very shortly trained Gentile missionaries out to tell their story, Jesus himself returned to the area 
and carried on a much more extensive mission there. And if you remember the story in Matthew 15, 29 to 39 and Mark 8, 1 to 10, he actually fed 4,000 men, not counting women and children, and they all came out there and they spent days with him and he ministered to them. And this was a primarily Gentile area. Yes. As I recall, didn't Jesus tell those two former, one or two formerly demon-possessed people, go and tell what the Lord has done for you? Mm -hmm. He didn't say, you know, here's, here's, 25 uh, doctrines yeah, here's all the doctrines. Nope. Tell them what God has done for you. Yes, exactly. Well, number three. For the last six months of his public ministry, many people don't recognize this, Jesus traveled almost exclusively in Samaritan and Perean, non-Jewish areas and carried out his ministry there. Read about it in Luke 9, 51 to 1927. That's where some of his strangest parables were. Yes. For them. Yes. He's now in Gentile territory. Mm -hmm. Number four, after his resurrection, Jesus told his disciples just plainly, you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and where else? The the to the ends of the earth, Acts 1.8. But after Stephen's mighty speech is recorded in Acts 7, we've just spoken a little bit about that, a terrible persecution of Christians began in Jerusalem. Some of them went to Samaria, but others went to speak to Jews. Remember, notice, they went to speak to whom? Jews in the diaspora. They were scattered widely, but who were they out there to speak to? Jews. But how is that then a, in, in Bible prophecy, uh, don't we identify the end of that week as where the gospel went to the Gentiles? You, you, you're getting ahead of me a little bit. Oh. Hold on, we're, we're, we're going there. There's one, one specific that Jesus said also, and that was the parable of the Good Samaritan, mm -hmm. which was very explicitly kind of trying to get the yep. disciples and the people to see that these Samaritans are worthy also. Yeah. Number six, Peter was sent by God to the home of Cornelius, a Roman centurion who was already interested in the Jewish religion. Now, here's someone who is already worshiping with Jews, he's following of a lot of Jewish ideas, but still he's a Roman. He's a Roman military man and Peter sent to him and what happens at his house? They receive the Holy Spirit. And what did the brethren back in Jerusalem have to say about, and that's by the way Acts 10, 1 to 4, what did the brethren back in Jerusalem have to say about that when they heard about it? No, no, Peter, what have you been doing? Well, they were ready to condemn Peter for what he had done. However, after hearing how the Holy Spirit had been poured out on Cornelius and his family, they accepted the idea, these would be the disciples, accepted the idea that God was ready to welcome Gentiles as Christians also, assuming, of course, they're following all the Jewish customs and practices, etc. Acts 11, 1 to 18. Then came a huge step, and this is incredible when you stop to think about it. Number eight, unidentified Christians. We don't even know these people's names. From Cyprus and Cyrene, which is modern day Libya, belonging to the multicultural church in Antioch, began to actively preach to Gentiles in Antioch. That's the first time. The Greek actually states that they preached to anyone speaking Greek, which would have to include Gentiles. It was in Antioch, remember, that the believers were first called Christians. And you can read those, those ideas in Acts 11, 20, and 26. Number nine, under the direction of the brethren in Jerusalem, Barnabas went to Antioch to explore the growth of the church there. You know, they hear about these marvelous things. I mean, the church in Antioch is just exploding and the people in Jerusalem says, hmm, something must be going on up there. They sent Barnabas up to explore. And what does he do? He helps them for a little bit and he says, we need some, we need some more help here. I remember there's a certain man over in Tarsus who might be able to help us. And he went and recruited Paul. 
Acts 11, 22 to 25. Now, we, we haven't talked about how Paul ended up in Tarsus yet. We're going to get back to that. After working in Antioch for a year, Paul and Barnabas, directed by God, set out on their first missionary journey to intentionally evangelize Jews and Gentiles in Asia Minor, which we now call Turkey. Acts 13, 1 to 3. Hearing about the work of Paul and Barnabas had work Paul and Barnabas had been doing, some men went from Jerusalem to Antioch, insisting that Gentiles must follow all the Jewish practices before they could become Christians. Acts 15, 1 and 2. The Jerusalem Council met, and after considerable discussion, set out the conditions under which Gentile Christians would be allowed to worship alongside Jewish Christians. And of course, that's their their summary in Acts 15 verses 28 and 29. Paul, after returning to Ephesus and working there for three years, travels to Corinth and dealing with the problems of Corinth and later with the problems in Galatia and Rome, Paul made it absolutely clear that Gentiles would be accepted by God on the basis of faith alone and not on the basis of following any Jewish practices. And that, of course, is 1 Corinthians 8 and 10, Romans 14 and Galatians 3. So, there's a sort of sequence of things that went from we don't speak to anybody unless they're Jewish to I don't care what you belong to, where you came from, what your nationality is, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you can be saved. That was the sequence. Any comments about that? I've still got my question about the time and prophecies of Daniel 7. Yes. Okay. Am I still ahead of you? No, go ahead. Let's, let's talk about that now, because we're going to talk some more about that coming up. I asked something else first yeah. about that. Don't I remember that Abraham was supposed to minister to the Gentiles? <clears throat> That's also coming up. I mean, okay. there's so many things that are sort of related here. It's, yeah, Mo, Abraham was told all, back, all the way back in, in, in Genesis 12 that you are supposed to be a blessing to all nations. Not just to his family. Not just to his family. We've interpreted the prophecy in Daniel 7 mm -hmm. that the one week cut off for the Jews mm -hmm. ended with the stoning of Stephen. Yes. So if, if that was for the Gentiles from there on, you're, you're saying they didn't go to the Gentiles then? What I'm saying is it took a little while to get even the brethren to change their ideas. You don't, so why do we use that? Why do we use the story well, of Stephen then? Because that was the point at which people were scattered, and they went fairly quickly to places like Antioch, and it wasn't very long before people up there started talking about spreading the started speaking to Gentiles. You, you, in the, you said here some of them went in, went to Samaria, mm -hmm. but others that was that was Gentile country. Well, yeah, Samaritans are sort of half Gentile. Half Jews, half Gentiles. Well, they weren't considered part of the crew. No, no. no. <laughs> but others to speak to the Jews. Who did the ones go to speak to that went to Samaria? They spoke to Samaritans. And they were the sort of half Jews. Well, maybe we'll tie our Daniel 7 to that sure, then. Sure, we can. <laughs> okay. Well, but I mean, the truth is that within a year, within a year, Paul was recruited and things were happening. So it, it, it wasn't that long after that experience. I mean, when they scattered, God says, okay, now the fire is, is spreading. Okay. It's like, like the, the influence exploded right then. Yeah. It wasn't really hitting the Gentiles very hard yeah. then, but yet it was fixing it was, itself out to, it was to out really do that. Yeah. And so. the important point is we often link it to the stoning of Stephen. And sure, that's related, but what happened the result of so Stephen's speech is the part we need to focus on. What happened? That very day, there began an intense persecution of Christians in Jerusalem. And that's why they scattered. That's why, they, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to make sure that people understand that it's not just the fact that Stephen got stoned that somehow spread the gospel of the Gentiles. It's no, the no, fact no. that the Christians were intensely persecuted and, poof, and they went out. They went out. It kind of still points to the fact that it started out being a Jewish yes. thing. I mean, it came from the Jews. Yep. So, 
you know, to say that this is some alien thing when Jews say this is an alien religion, it's not true. No. It came out of their, mm -hmm. the Jewish um, culture. It arose because they hadn't done what they were supposed to do. If they had carried the gospel to the whole world, being a blessing to all nations, there would have been no necessity of a Christian church. Now we mentioned Cornelius. Mm -hmm. Don't I recall that Jesus also healed someone that was a non-Jew? Well, probably not. He probably healed a Jew. It was a, the, the centurion's servant that was healed. Centurion, okay. So he was, we, we talk about him because he's a Roman centurion, yeah. but it's, the servant may have been a Jew. Yes. Okay. But he, he related to the same group. But you see, all of this is part of, and, and obviously I didn't have a chance to, produce, to put everything here we could possibly mention. But it's a very interesting sequence. You see, God keeps nudging them a little further, a little further, a little further, a little further, until Paul says, there is no difference between male and female. There is no difference between Jew and Greek. There is no difference between slave and free. The gospel belongs to everybody. Galatians 3.28. But we haven't got there yet. We just did. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think of God's methods of converting? Now we're going to go back more specifically and look at the story of Paul. What do you think of God's methods of converting Saul or Paul? Was he using force on him or just getting his attention? Well, I like the <laughs> attention model. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you probably remember the stories. People, this has been told many times about the man who who had a donkey and he sold it to this other guy and, the do and he says, if you just get his attention, he'll just do anything you want. And the other guy gets his donkey and he would not move, he did everything, couldn't. And so he comes back to the guy who sold him and he says, what do you said? This donkey just do anything, if just get him, just, yeah, he says, just get his attention. Well, how do you get his attention? So he takes this big old two four and he whacks him with the two four and the donkey sort of wakes up and goes off and does his work. He says, see, you just gotta get his attention. <laughs> Is that what God did to Saul? <laughs> well, that's what I'm asking you. Is that how God, <laughs> God got Saul's attention? I mean, we know that, you know, the story, I suppose we should just look at one of these places here. It might well take something like that because what he had been grounded in and what he had been taught, it was a part of his life. Yeah. It was what he was all about. Exactly. Let, go, go to Acts 9, and we'll just look at one of the places where Paul tells the story. So we have the, the story, everybody's thinking in the same terms. Acts 9, I'm starting with verse 1. In the meantime, Saul cupped up his violent threats of murder against the followers of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked for letters of introduction to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he should find there any followers of the way of the Lord. And what does he mean by followers of the way? I am the that way, was, the truth, and the life. Yeah, that was a code Jesus. word for Christians back in the early days. He would be able to arrest them, both men and women, and bring them back to Jerusalem. As Saul was coming near the city of Damascus, we're going to talk about his journey in a little bit, suddenly a light from the sky flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Another nose in the ground experience. Another nose in the ground experience. But notice something very interesting. Who is Paul persecuting? God. Christ. He didn't touch Jesus. He couldn't go to heaven and persecute him. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the one of the least of these, you have done oh, it unto me. Okay. So God says that his people, his Christian people here on this earth, if you touch them, you're touching him. That's what it says. Well, who are you, Lord? He asked. I am Jesus, whom you persecute. He says it again. The boy said, but get up and go into the city where you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with Saul had stopped, not saying a word. They heard the voice, but could not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground and opened his eyes, but could not see a thing. So they took him by the hand and led him into, the, into Damascus. For three days he was not able to see, and during that time he did not eat or drink anything. There was a believer in Damascus. Well, let me stop there for now. Uh, there was a little phrase left out that the King James has there. Yes. Uh, that's the one where it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Well, that's, um, 
that's found elsewhere. Tal, Paul tells this story three times. Oh, okay. And it's imported from another place. And l l let's look at that since you asked about it. It's Acts 26, verses 12 to 19. Um, let's see. Verse 14. Isn't it verse 14. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, I'm looking at the wrong chapter here. No wonder I can't find it. Verse, verse, chapter 26, verse 14. Mm -hmm. All of us fell to the ground, and I heard a voice say to me in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You're hurting yourself by hitting back like an ox kicking against its owner's stick. So this, the story is told three times, and, and there's some slight differences in the story. And some versions of the Bible um, import parts of the story to other places. But it's, it's, it's all there. It's all part of the story. For an interesting comparison of these three crowds, by the way, for those of you who want to dig a little deeper, look again at SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, in the section under Acts 9, verse 3. Well, my question again. Was, Paul using, was God using force on Paul? My thought when you first said that was, uh, did God use force on Pharaoh? Back in Any Genesis. Any more Back than he Exodus. used force on Paul. The, the ten plagues would seem like somewhat of a force. Would seem that way. Yeah. Gentle the persuasion. Pharaoh <laughs> did not respond in the same way that no. Paul did. No. So what's the difference there? Well, Paul, what, what's Paul doing? Paul believes that he's doing right. He believes that he's doing what God wants him to do. And someone who is just hell-bent on, on and doing what they think is right, it takes a little bit of persuading to get them to change their mind. And the fact that he remained blind kept him thinking that. Because mm -hmm. I kind of wonder what would happen if all of a sudden everything went back to normal again, if he would just... Uh, must have been, I can't explain that, let's just keep going, you know, yeah. type of thing. Well, here's Paul. He, he sees this thing, this thing with Stephen, and he's, you know, he, he, can't, he can't erase that picture from his mind. The face of Stephen shining with that light just burned into his consciousness. But yet, he, you know, he has his mentors, he has his Gamaliel experience, he has his own upbringing. He says it can't all be wrong. So what happened? Well, Saul Paul had to walk about 150 miles from Jerusalem to Damascus. There's a couple different roads he could have gone. We don't know which way he took, but it's about the same either way. There's no evidence that any of Saul Paul's group were riding any animal when they all fell to the ground, the verse we just read. We need to remember that during this journey, Saul Paul probably had no one which he as a conservative Pharisee was allowed to talk with. He had a lot of time to think about his conscience. And I quote, this is from the Daily Study Bible, the writ of the Sanhedrin ran wherever there were Jews. Their authority was over Jews. Paul had heard that certain of the Christians had escaped to Damascus and he asked for letters of credit that he might go to Damascus and extradite them. The journey only made matters worse. It was about 140 miles, 140, 150, from Jerusalem to Damascus. The journey would be made on foot and would take about a week. Paul's only companions were the officers of the Sanhedrin, a kind of police force. Because he was a Pharisee, he could have nothing to do with them, so he walked alone. And as he walked, he thought, because there was nothing else to do. Would you say that God was being gentle with Saul, Paul, when he knocked him down, blinded him? after a whole week of thinking? Just the right amount of force. <laughs> that's, well, that's it. Force? Yeah. <laughs> Look, he could have he said, oh, baloney, I'm not going to... Gonna yeah, God body. didn't take away his freedom. Yeah. Okay, he, had to have, he had to have his free chance for a free moral choice. And he was weighted down here, and God had to put a little force on the other end of the teeter-totter to get him up level. Yeah. Well, well didn't that's, that's that's to make his point. Force of the point. It's not really 
force in him. Sure. Yeah. So. Sure. Well, didn't God, didn't Saul deserve to be punished at that point? He's been killing Christians. Well, he was disciplined, you could say, by God. Mm -hmm. You could say that. But there's a very interesting point that we need to think about here. Now, we think, we think Saul, Paul, oh yes, the, God, the, the apostle to the Gentiles, we think of all the things he did and all the things he suffered and et cetera, but none of that's happened yet. If you were right at that point in history and you knew nothing else about what's going on and what's going to happen in the future, wouldn't you say God is going to punish this guy? He's going to, he's going to fry him, right? Depends Shouldn't he? Your, depends on your picture of God, I guess. Well, isn't that what he deserved? Um, I mean, the guy who's going... God. <laughs> who's, who's, well, well, no, don't, don't it, give me looking that. Looking at it from human terms, sure. Yeah. But that's not the way God looks at things. Well, how does God look at it? That, he that's looks the in the heart. and He saw all that energy that was being directed to what he thought was right. He said, all I got to do is change that, and I got a nice energetic guy going my way. Okay. Well, there's a very interesting... The reason I'm focusing on this point is that God looked at Paul. He knew what Paul was capable of doing in the future. Sure. He wasn't judging Paul based on all what he had done so far in the past. What happens when God judges us? Same song, second verse. Same song. It's not so much what happened in the past, it's what we potentially could do in the future. The people who are admitted to heaven are admitted to heaven not on the basis of some great thing they did in the past, but on the basis of what God knows they will do in the future. He can't admit to people, he, people to heaven who aren't safe to save. Isn't that what uh, was said about David when he was chosen to be anointed mm -hmm. to be the future king? Mm -hmm. You know, they're all the older brothers. You know, no, it's not them. Not them. God looks at the heart. Yep, exactly. Well, maybe his enthusiasm was really for God. God is up there looking down at him and says, oh, he's just got it wrong. He just got it wrong. How are we going to get him straightened out so we'll go the other direction? Yeah. And I think he would. I mean... God would, wouldn't need to do that with any of us. Of course not. Well, <laughs> yeah, but some people are just yeah, lethargic no matter what they're doing. I mean, Paul was just, he, he went after what he thought was right the whole time. But he knew there, I think, so, I think there was some confusion in his mind. It wasn't that he yeah. knew he was doing wrong. He was struggling. He, he was, was struggling, struggling, trying to straighten it out and figure out what's going on here. And well, I think God just, just gave him the opportunity to be able to just you mean turn he, it around. You mean he showed him the light. Paul, he showed him the light, yeah. <laughs> Paul sure. wouldn't have fit in the Laodicean church very well. He would not fit. Never. And, and, and that's a point. You know, God would rather have people who are on fire, even if they got a few things mixed up, than people who are sitting on their seats and not willing to do anything. That's right. Welcome to Laodicea. Right. But usually those kind of people, if they had the information, they will turn around and, and yeah. be more in, in precise. The people are on fire. Yeah. 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 Are we absolutely sure about all our beliefs? Could any of our beliefs be absolutely wrong? They might be, but it would take something like that to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, French philosopher and mathematician. Right. <laughs> we could not be wrong. We could not be wrong. No. <laughs> French philosopher and mathematician Blaise Pascal wrote, quote, Men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from a religious conviction. End quote. Oh, that's true. That's true. And others have stated, and you've heard this in, in various kinds of words, but more wars have been fought in the name of religion than for any other reason. Why is that? Because they know they're right. Yeah. Yes. We know we're right. And God's on their side. And God's on our side. Yeah. God, here, both sides in the war. God's on our side. Yeah. So it's not the religion that causes the war, it's the, you, you knowing that you're right? Well, and yeah, to a large extent. You know, so I don't know if you've heard say, this. World peace would come if we could just get rid of all the religion. 
they're not hitting the well that's the what right. a, that's what a lot of people are saying in our day that's right that's but they're not really hitting what the problem is no problem is in the person who has the religion thinking that they're correct the example yeah. <laughs> of this comes from World War One, you know, and that in the days when they had these trenches and they were about a mile apart, and that's about as far as they could shoot a gun, and you know, and they could they could actually see each other across there, and you know, they would hide down there like this. And the German troops held up a sign that said "Gott mit uns," which of course means "God is with us." And Americans, with their irreverence as usual, they knew perfectly well what the Germans were saying, but they took their their guns with a with a saber on the end of it, and they held up this sign that says, "We got mittens too." <laughs> 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 so <laughs> that's <laughs> so anyway, that's about the way it is. Well, what category do we belong to? Are we on fire in Laodicea? Are we pretty apathetic? You remember the story of Laodicea? Let's just look at those verses for a moment. Well, if we're not apathetic, we're not Laodicea. Oh, you think so? <laughs> to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, this is the message from the Amen, the faithful and true witness, who is the origin of all that God has created. And this is, by the way, is in Revelation 3, verses 14 to 22. I know what you have done. I know that you are neither cold nor hot how I wish you were either one or the other. I mean, God would rather have us be cold than just lukewarm. But because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich and well off. I have all I need. And by the way, that spit you out of my mouth means literally vomit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich and well off. I have all I need. But you do not know how miserable and pitiful you are. You are poor, naked, and blind. I advise you then to buy gold from me, pure gold, in order to be rich, but buy also white clothing to dress yourself and cover up your shameful nakedness. Buy also some ointment to put on your eyes so that you may see. I rebuke and punish all whom I love. Be in earnest then and turn from your sins. Be in earnest. Isn't that what Paul was? Listen, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them, and they will eat with me. To those who win the victory, you can't win a victory without putting forth some effort. I will give the right to sit beside me in my throne, just as I have been victorious and now sit by my Father on his throne. So if you belong to a church that doesn't look like that, get out of it and go find one that does. Isn't that, isn't that God's church? Well... I would say probably it represents all organized religion, and most of them are pretty sad. And when you come over to Revelation 14 and Revelation 18, it says, get out of that organized religion which we call Babylon. But he's not talking about Babylon there. Well, how do you know? How do you know he's not? I think, I think if you look down through there, he's talking about all people who call themselves Christians. If you look at the messages to the churches, you know, right down through there, it's, it's I mean, you, you look back at a church like Thyatira, those are certainly not people faithfully doing what God wants. That, that's all the people who call themselves Christians. You know, it sounds like they're, they're believing everything correctly, but they're not putting anything to the test where it yeah. starts shaking things up. So here's the question. So that's the point. Yeah. yeah. Here's the question. How can we be fully convinced and absolutely zealous for our beliefs, be on fire like Paul was, and at the same time humble in the face of truth? Well, we is it hard to do that? Humble we must be willing to learn. Yeah. Can you be zealous and convicted and in, in pushing forward and and going places and still be willing to learn. I think you yes, have to but most be. aren't. Most aren't. That, that seems like a, a weird mixture, doesn't it? It does. Because you've got to be able to stand firm and go for it, you know, and don't give up, but yet still be open enough to 
the evidence that maybe you're doing something wrong and you might have to backtrack. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. how in the world do you have those two forces and still get anywhere? Yeah. Well, you do it like Paul. Mm -hmm. When you find out, when, you, when God presents you with new information and you are convinced that it's from God, you get on with it. Yeah, it looks like he still had his foot on to the floor with the gas pedal Absolutely. the whole time. Absolutely. Whether he was doing the wrong thing or doing the right thing, he's still going. Yeah. So That's right. Most of us don't have our foot on the pedal. That's yeah. right. I'll save gas. Well, <laughs> let's, let's, let's talk about um, the circumstances, some more circumstances. Damascus was an ancient city, mentioned many times in the Old Testament. There are those who would claim that Damascus is the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. So after Paul or Saul, or now we're going to call him Paul, had been blinded and knocked down by the brilliant light, he got up. He realized he was blind. He had to be led by hand into the city of Damascus. For reasons that we're not told about, he was taken to the home of Judas. Now who, who led him into the city? Apparently, it was the people that Sanhedrin. were traveling with him. They, yeah, uh, probably police, these Sanhedrin so police people. Yeah. Why would they take, what do we know about Judas? He lived on Straight Street. Okay, anything else we know about him? He was, he, I think it said he was a man of God or a disciple or something of that sort. In Acts of the Apostles, page 118, Ellen White calls him a disciple. Why is it? that these people who were going along with Paul specifically to arrest and kill, eventually kill Christians, would take Paul to a Christian. Was he a physician? They'd he been through an like experience God. too. Mm -hmm. And do you think they were thinking, God, how do we get rid of this guy? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> where, where do we dump him? <laughs> God led those men just as he led Saul. Think so. Maybe. To go to Judas. Well. Tell me some other way. Yeah. Well, they said they heard the voice. <laughs> Paul so probably said, if you don't take me there, you know what's going to happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we know nothing else about this man who call, we call Judas, except that he lived on Straight Street. By the way, there's still two major Christian groups. They're not large Christian groups, but they're significant Christian groups, Orthodox Christian groups, who have their church headquarters on Straight Street. It's still there. You can go still to the place that they believe was this very spot on Straight Street where Paul stayed for those three days. Well, uh, at the time Saul Paul went there, there were an estimated 10 to 18,000 Jews living in Damascus. There were probably 30 to 40 synagogues in Damascus. A few years later, Nero killed, butchered, literally, 10,000 Jews just in Damascus. So it gives us an idea of how large the city was how many Jews were there, and where do you think the Christians would be worshiping at this point? At the synagogues. In the synagogues. Wouldn't they be worshiping? The, that's what the Christians did in those days. He was worshiping in the synagogues. So there's a lot of place for them to sort of, and if things get a little hot in one synagogue, you go to a different one, you know? <laughs> well, three days later, we know Ananias was told in a vision to go and anoint Saul Paul. Did Ananias know why Paul had come to, Jer to Damascus? I imagine he had Absol a pretty good idea. <laughs> Absolutely he knew. The, the, the Bible says so. So what did, what did God say to Ananias to convince him to go over there and anoint Saul or Paul? Saul is willing to learn. What did... God actually say to Ananias. Do you remember? It's very interesting. Sorry, here I'm getting in the wrong place. Do you remember what the words were? Mm -hmm. Like I have need of him or something like that. Yeah. 
you're getting close. Um, look at yeah, look at Acts nine verses fifteen and sixteen. The Lord said to him, this is to Ananias, go because I have chosen him to serve me, to make known my name to make my name known to Gentiles and kings and the people of Israel, and I myself will show him all that he must suffer for my sake. So now I have a question for you. For most of the Jews, or even the Christians in Damascus, at that date, on that day, would it have been more shocking to know that Paul had suddenly become a Christian, or more shocking to know that God planned to carry the gospel to the Gentiles? Probably the latter. <laughs> Probably the latter. You know, sometimes we don't, we don't, look, we think, oh, wow, he, he's going, and here's this Saul, and he's been converted, and now he's a Christian. But I think probably for the Christians and certainly for the Jews in Damascus, the idea that the gospel was probably go, supposed to go to the Gentiles was even more of a shock. He must have had a real communication that he knew with God, or he would have never taken on that. He'd have done a Jonas and gotten out of That's there, right? right. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that whole claim or that whole statement there was so unbelievable and yeah. so so out of the ordinary so so fantastic you're bound to think something was going to happen you wonder if he didn't have a nose in the ground experience before yeah. he got told that yeah. <laughs> it's just about as wild as god telling abraham to go sacrifice his son right yeah well after saul paul spent some time in damascus and he didn't spend very long there and he retreated into the deserts of Arabia to think things through. He returned to Damascus sometime maybe two, three years later. I don't know how long it took, what Paul exactly was doing out there in, the, in Arabia, but he spent quite a bit of time out there. He began to preach the gospel with absolute conviction and vigor in Damascus. The Jews became so upset that they intended to kill him, but he was let down over the wall at night in a basket and fled to Jerusalem. What kind of a reception do you think he expected to get when he got to Jerusalem? Hey, I'm on your side now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm yeah, listening. Right. <laughs> reception by which group? Well, that's the first question. Which group? Who would, he, who would he be facing when he got back to Jerusalem? First of all, Theoretically, I mean, under normal circumstances, where would he go? Synagogue. Back Synagogue. to his family, wouldn't he? Yeah. Do you think his family would have him? Apparently not. There's no hint of them accepting him back. Well, then, given the conditions under which he left Jerusalem, you would have thought, okay, the first people he should go back to would be the Sanhedrin, right? Do you think they would welcome him at this point in time? Not at all. So the people he would want to go to would be who? Other Christians. Other Christians. What do we know about that? They didn't accept him either. Saul, and look, look at the rest of the story, Acts 9, starting with verse 26. Saul went to Jerusalem and tried to join the disciples, but they would not believe that he was a disciple. This is three years later, after he's been converting people to, be, to Christianity up in Damascus. They still not going to believe him. And they were all afraid of him. Then Barnabas came to his help and took him to the apostles. He explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and that the Lord had spoken to him. He also told them how boldly Saul had preached in the name of Jesus in Damascus. And so Saul stayed with them and went all over Jerusalem preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He also talked and disputed with the Greek-speaking Jews, but they tried to kill him. Who else had formerly spoken to the Greek-speaking Jews? and ended up getting himself killed? Stephen. Stephen. Same story, second verse, right? Yeah. When the believers found out about this, the fact that these people are trying to kill him, they took Saul to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. And why did he go to Tarsus? That's where he came from. That's where he came from. He went back home, right? We do not know exactly what Paul did for the next several years. It was very likely that he did his best to spread the gospel around Tarsus and Cilicia, possibly in some areas of Syria as well. 
And what happens next in our story? Well, there's a very interesting few verses in 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 4. Now, this isn't dated. Tell me when you think this happened. I guess I really ought to start with verse 3, so we, we get the context. I passed on to you what I received, which is of the greatest importance, that Christ died for our sins, as written in the Scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised to life three days later, as written in the Scriptures, that he appeared to Peter and then to all twelve apostles, then he appeared to more than 500 of his followers at once, most of whom are still alive, although some have died. Then he appeared to James and afterwards to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared also to me, even though I am like someone whose birth was abnormal. For I am the least of the apostles. I do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted God's church. Now, where did he learn all of that? It says he got it by, if we go over to Galatians, which we're going to study in, the, in our, our future sessions, <clears throat> it says he got all this as a direct revelation from God. Up there in Arabia. He had, he had some time. I mean, he knew the scriptures inside and out, and he had a tremendous amount of time, and he reviewed all that in the light of his new experience. Yeah. We call I call that a paradigm shift? Yep. Yes. I think he had multiple interactions with God in Arabia and even back in Tarsus. Mm. A lot was going on during that year and when those years. And when Barnabas came to get him from Tarsus, he was full of the fire and he was ready to go. Yeah. yeah. Well, why do you think God chose Saul, Paul? Now let's come back to our question. Was it because God knew that the task of spreading the gospel to the Gentiles would require a champion who was on fire for what he believed? Yeah. Well, he went to Antioch, we know. Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. Only Rome and Alexandria and Egypt were larger. It was a very cosmopolitan city with people from all parts of the world living there. Antioch was the city of the capital, the Roman province of Syria, and had an estimated population of 500,000. In such a city, it would be very easy for Christians to meet together without raising a lot of suspicion. Christianity had already become something of a cosmopolitan church, although the members were all previously Jewish by religion. Paul and Barnabas worked together there, and then there, as we already mentioned earlier, they were sent forth, and thus we have the real roots of the mission to carry the gospel to Gentiles. And that's what Paul is going to be talking about as we study with him, follow his ideas and his thoughts through the book of Galatians as we study these next 12 weeks. See you then.